Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Case Studies on Course Material Affordability Programs at North American University Libraries, which is sponsored by Springer Nature. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, um, <laughs> products, and uh, products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of, of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the button with a little dialogue cloud on it uh, along the bottom of your screen. Um, and you should also see down there a little button with three dots on it in which you can find um, the Q&A panel. At the end of the presentation, um, our speakers will take a few minutes to answer your questions. So please send your questions in through the Q&A panel throughout. Um, and if you experience any technical issues, that's what the chat box is for. You can message me directly and I will uh, work that out with you in private. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars. So if you've got another screen handy, feel free to shout, it out, shout out to us. We are at choice underscore reviews. Also note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And here to introduce our speakers today is Matt Peck from Springer Nature. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we will swiftly be move, moving on to our first presentation. Um, welcome to Case Studies on Course Material Affordability Programs at North American University Libraries. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Matt Peck, and I'm Content Marketing Manager for eBooks at Springer Nature based in London. Just to set the scene for you, although I can uh, reliably inf inform you it's not that sunny, dry, um, or light at the moment as we're having a stereotypically miserable day in London, but we are happy to be joining you here this, this evening. Um, I will be introducing our first speaker shortly, but before that I just want to give you an idea of what we're going to cover today. Um, so first of all, you're going to learn about course material affordability initiatives at two large uni US universities. Um, you'll hear how our two academic libraries provide students with access to required content, how librarians and faculty members inter interact to assess and provide relevant course materials. You'll also observe differing approaches to the implementation of course materials in the university classroom. Later on, you're going to find out about some popular Spring and Nature textbooks, uh, observing how students interact with textbooks, gaining insights into the commissioning process, concluding with some information on which Textbooks are used uh, the most globally and in the US and any reasons why this might be. As Mark said, there will be a chance for Q&A at the end. So who are our speakers? Well, first of all, we have uh, Elizabeth Seiler, who's Collection Development Librarian at USC, UNC Charlotte uh, Atkins Library in the US. Um, Elizabeth will be followed by Cheryl Coulia, who's Open Education Librarian at the University of Arizona in the US. And then finally, we have uh, my colleague Jörg Sicht, who is Head of Product Technologies for Major Reference Works and former Mathematics Editor at Spring Nature. Okay, so first up, uh, we have Elizabeth. As I said, she is Collection Development Librarian. Um, in her current role, Liz manages the budget for both print and electronic content and facilitates acquisition decisions across the collection. Liz has taken a strong interest in textbook affordability on campus and spearheaded the creation of the e-textbook database to encourage faculty to use library e-books as required course materials. Um, she also served as the team lead of the course research team for the Charlotte Initiative cover covering the permanent acquisition of e-books by academic libraries where a team of librarians and publishers discussed issues surrounding the use of library purchased e-books as course materials. I'm going to move on to uh, Liz's first slide and hand over to Liz. Now, hi everybody. I hope everyone's getting ready for the uh, Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about textbook affordability here um, on our campus. Um, 
I'm sure a lot of you have seen this uh, graph before, but basically it shows the um, increase of the cost of textbooks um, going along with the increase of the, of the cost of higher education, and it has increased exponentially, which is a uh, burden on our students. For example, here at UNC Charlotte, um, a student will spend an average of $1,200 a year on their textbooks. And the one thing about textbooks is it is the only um, uh, thing in um, higher education that the students can actually make a decision about in terms of whether or not they're going to purchase it. Um, they could not purchase it at all, they could um, try to share with a friend, or they could choose not to take a class because the cost of the textbook is too expensive. So. Um, the library is in a unique position to help with textbook affordability as the main content provider on um, a university's campus. Um, in addition to the um, increase of the purchase of ebooks that can be used um, by students at any time and anywhere um, as part of our collection. So at UNCC, we um, purchase ebooks in a particular way that we um, have promoted as part of the Charlotte Initiative. And um, we have three principles that we follow that we feel are particularly important when you are um, uh, promoting the use of your ebooks for course use. Um, the principles include unlimited simultaneous use so that students who are using the, the uh, ebook for their course, all the students are able to access it at any time. Um, they are uh, DRM free, so the students can use them how they learn best. Uh, and um, they are uh, perpetual access, so the uh, uh, book can be assigned in future semesters uh, without the fear of uh, losing access uh, in the future. So, and there are also other features that are, um, that help optimize learning. So, for example, um, if you uh, provide the textbook through library resources or also uh, open textbooks, with our, which our library also promotes. Um, the availability of, availability of the textbook is there at the beginning of the semester. Um, a lot of times students will wait until the first or second class to determine whether or not they need to buy the textbook, but this could hinder learning. So the textbook will be there even before the class starts so the student can start looking at it and reading it um, and will be uh, ready for class on day one. Um, there is the option, particularly through Springer, for the ability to purchase a low-cost print version through their uh, My Copy option. Um, this is a good option because a lot of students uh, prefer to read in print. Um, this is something that many studies have shown, and so to give them this low-cost option is, is um, great for the students. Um, there is also uh, the options of uh, downloading the, bo the book in different formats, and you can di download the entire book. You can download it to a reader, or you can read it on your phone or a tablet, or you can download it to your computer. And you can also just download sing single chapters. So if a faculty member, for example, only wants to assign a few chapters from a book and wants to assign several books, then they, students can download just the single chapters, and they can be printed out uh, for easy reading. Um, the other really nice feature that you get with ebooks that are provided through the library that you most likely wouldn't get with a traditional textbook um, is the ability to link to articles that are cited within articles or other materials that are cited uh, within the chapter so that the student can actually do some deeper reading on what they're learning about just from that, um, the chapter that was assigned in their class. So here at UNC Charlotte, we have a couple of ways that we um, promote textbook affordability. One thing that we do is we get the bookstore or list of, type of books that have been um, selected by faculty members as textbooks uh, from the bookstore. And we um, review it and find all of the books that we can purchase from the vendors that meet our requirements. And then we go ahead and purchase those books and make those uh, links available to the faculty member prior to the beginning of the semester. Um, the second thing we do is we try to encourage faculty to use library and open, ed open educational resources um, as required course materials. Um, there are two ways we do this currently. We have the e-textbook database, which I will show you in the next slide. And then later on in the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about our mini grants that um, we are awarding faculty members for switching from pay uh, textbooks to um, open or library provided textbooks. So this is our e-textbook e uh, database, and I'm going to go ahead and pop out of the slides so that I can show you um, the, uh, how the database works. Oops. 
Please don't look at all the files that I have on my computer. Um, so here is our uh, database. Um, and it can be searched by title or subject, author or ISBN. So if I were to just search, clearly I've already searched this before, um, climate change. These are um, the results that come up. And just for a little uh, uh, information about the back end of the database, um, it is an SQL database, and it is populated entirely by title lists that um, we acquire from the publishers. So as you can see over on the far right, there's um, subject information. That subject has been assigned by the publisher and not um, official subject headings. Um, so these are the results that you'll get. And um, you can look at uh, the detailed information here or faculty members can, to see um, it gives some summary information. It will give some table of contents information to help them make um, a, you know, decisions as to whether or not it might be something they would be interested in assigning in their classes. Um, and then um, in the event that uh, they would like to use it, um, they have the option to request it or use it. So if you click this button here where it says use it, it comes to a form, and the form um, is filled out and sent to us for record keeping purposes. But as soon as the form is filled out, a link is sent directly to the faculty member. Um, so they are able to share that link with their students uh, immediately. Um, uh, if we don't have it, you can click the request this button. And um, you can request the title, and it will be sent to my department. We'll order it, and once the title is available, we will send the link directly to the faculty member to share with their students. Um, so that's basically um, how the uh, database works. Now, unfortunately, um, maybe not everything is in here that we're aware that we can purchase. So there is the opportunity for faculty members just to email us directly to see if we can uh, get something that's not presented in here. Um, there have been opportunities for us to negotiate access with publishers that wouldn't otherwise give us access. So um, it's always good to at least check and make sure um, that it's something that we can get so that um, we're able to provide the best service to both our faculty and to our students. I also want to mention we are not the only ones that are doing this currently. Both LSU and uh, South Florida are, also have databases, and they both have um, unique qualities that um, have enhancements that we uh, do not have. So I would encourage you all to go and look at those databases as well, because I think they are um, wonderful. So there are, of course, benefits and drawbacks of using library resources um, for uh, course materials. The benefits you can see in the numbers. So each semester at UNC Charlotte, we provide about 150 books to our users as course use materials. Um, we serve between um, 1,500 and 2,000 students every semester. Um, and I will say with those books, about half are from the textbook list, and half are ones that are requested from the faculty. Um, we usually save students about $200,000 a semester on textbook costs. And this is based on the, uh, the list price of the new textbook. Um, assuming uh, that the book is not traditionally a textbook. Um, it's a li pretty limited cost to the library. At most, we'll spend about $15,000 a semester, um, which actually reduces every semester because books are um, frequently used multiple, for multiple sem semesters over multiple years. Um, so once we buy it and we have it, we don't have to um, buy it again. And then on average, it's about 50 cents a use, which I think is a really good um, return on investment. And then it, it um, increases the use of our eBooks as a whole. And just for the textbooks, we get about 14,000 full text downloads a semester, which I think is um, a good way to show uh, value in the eBooks that you purchase. Of course, um, there are drawbacks. Um, print books, as I said before, are preferred by students. Um, they, they prefer using them more than uh, eBooks. However, when it comes to having to pay for one and having one that's uh, freely available, oftentimes they'll choose the freely available option. Um, the database ebook list constantly needs to be updated. And um, unfortunately, currently, I'm a little short-staffed, so I don't really keep up with it as much as I would like. 
Um, fortunately, I will be hiring a new e-resources management librarian soon, if anybody's interested. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to keep that list as up-to-date as possible, especially as we continue to add more publishers to our list of preferred publishers. Um, the database design definitely needs updating. There are thing, information that's missing in the search, um, particularly we've been asked for publication date and things like that. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in the future as well. Um, also, the uh, library is actually unable mostly to get traditional textbooks, particularly core textbooks. So, you know, the books that probably would reach the most stu students, uh, the library unfortunately is unable to purchase from a um, from a publisher. However, there are a lot of open textbooks that that um, meet that requirement of a traditional textbook. So, we have been sort of um, pushing uh, that as well. Um, so those are the um, major uh, drawbacks to uh, using library resources. Oh, one more thing I wanted to mention. It's not on this on the slide, but um, a lot of our books are more course use books than they are traditional textbooks. So they are missing some of the ancillary material like quizzes and tests and things like that that faculty do like. So that's something um, that would need adjustments um, for faculty if they were to switch. Um, there's also benefits for collection development. Um, it leads to target of per targeted purchasing for individual books. So you know for sure if you're going to purchase an ebook at a particular cost, it's absolutely going to get used and used significantly. Um, it increases the cost per use for ebook packages. So if you buy a package of ebooks and it has some textbooks in there, it will shoot up your, your usage so that it'll help you make the case to buy more ebook packages in the future if you would like. It also helps make decisions for evidence based book purchasing. So if you are doing an evidence based model and you know there's some textbooks in there, you know immediately that you can purchase. Them because obviously the usage is going to be relatively high. And then just finally, a note about our mini grants. Um, we are uh, not the only uh, university that does this. Um, there are at least four others in the state of North Carolina that do mini grants along with um, uh, uh, the state itself, although those grants are specific to open uh, resources, not library resources. But basically what it is is that we provide funding um, at this point, which is $1,000 to a faculty member to move from a paid textbook to a freely available textbook, um, either open uh, textbook or a library provided materials. Um, this current uh, semester, we awarded seven faculty members this award. And originally, it was supposed to be five, but we got so many great applicants that we went, we bumped it up to seven. And by doing this, we are reaching um, uh, 1,175 uh, students over two semesters, and we're saving the students over $95,000. So um, we realize that it's a lot of work for faculty to change their classes um, to when they move to a new textbook. So um, that's why we're doing this. We're also going to be doing a faculty survey, which will show us if the work is worth it, if they think their students are doing better, if it's worth doing in the future so that we can start promoting it more. That's it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Liz. Um, Really interesting presentation. Um, I'm sure our audience all agree. Really nice to see a demo of the, the database as well. I'm sure there will be lots of questions coming through for that uh, on that subject at the end of the session. Um, guys, I can see a few of you have asked some questions. Please do continue to type in those questions. We will have time at the end for uh, the Q&A. Um, I'll swiftly move on to introduce our next speaker, who is Cheryl Coulier, who is Open Education Librarian at the University of Arizona. Um, Cheryl coordinates course material programs for university. She helps faculty find and use open, education, open educational resources, library license ebooks, and streaming video in courses. Um, as a faculty senator, Cheryl has worked to expand textbook affordability policies in the faculty handbook and has led OER initiatives at the University of Arizona since 2015. Nationally, she serves on the Open Textbook Network Steering Committee and is one of the instructors for the OTN's Certificate in OER Librarianship. Um, so I will hand over to Cheryl now. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so the, the University of Arizona um, is a public land grant institution in Tucson. We have a student body of over 44,000 students. And this year, we became designated as a Hispanic serving institution. We have students from all 50 states and 120 countries, and first-generation students make up more than 31% of this year's freshman class. 
Um, our library information budget is about $13 million a year, and digital is our preferred format. So as in my role as open education librarian and course material coordinator, I work one-on-one -on -one with faculty and instructional designers to find free or low-cost alternatives to expensive commercial textbooks. And I offer a range of options, um, kind of a spectrum of affordability. So all three of these options, open educational resources, library license materials, and inclusive access, provide day one access to content, which Liz mentioned is so important for student success. And I also consider it a social justice issue, ensuring more equitable access to knowledge and education. When all students have content on the first day of class, instructors say they can get started more quickly, assigning readings and homebook, homework, because like Liz said, they're not waiting weeks for students to acquire the course materials or to to decide whether to buy them at all. So on one end of the affordability spectrum, I start with free OER. And these are teaching, learning, and research resources that are in the public domain or have been released with an open license, usually a Creative Commons license. And anybody can use, copy, adapt, reshare OER. And I start here because OER provide free and perpetual access. They're completely customizable and they provide opportunities for open pedagogy um, involving students in the creation of OER like textbooks, videos, test banks, lab notes, and more. OER aren't available for every subject, so next on the affordability spectrum we explore library licensed ebooks and video content and scholarly articles. These are also free for our students to use, but they're not customizable, and access usually isn't perpetual. The DRM free book DRM free ebooks like Springer's are a rare exception for us, and it's really nice when students can download the whole ebook and keep it. Um, if an instructor prefers content from a commercial publisher, I share a third option uh, called inclusive access. And our UA bookstores began piloting this model in 2016. With inclusive access, which goes by a variety of other names, all students uh, in a course get free access to the digital materials until the classes drop ad date. If they don't opt out of buying the content, its cost is automatically applied to their bursar account so they can use financial aid to pay for it. If they do opt out, they lose access. And depending on the semester, only about 1% to 10% of UA students have opted out. So in exchange for sales to more than 90% of a class, publishers say they'll offer deep discounts. And our bookstores say they're averaging 50% savings off the price of new print. So we first began piloting open textbooks at the UA in 2014. And our library website features resources for finding, creating, and using OER. We feature the new mega search tool from SUNY Geneseo called OASIS, which searches open content from 72 different sources. And we had a textbook heroes campaign featuring um, faculty who have adopted or adapted OER. These are some of our faculty rock stars from math, business, and physics. And uh, so we produce posters of them to publicize and, and give them some recognition. Moving on to library licensed ebooks, these are just some of the titles we've been able to provide in past semesters, and they cover a wide range of disciplines. Uh, like UNC Charlotte, each semester we get a list from our bookstores of required textbooks that faculty have submitted. We see which ones we already own as multi user ebooks and which ones we can acquire. Um, unlike UNC Charlotte, uh, we don't require that they be unlimited user licenses, which I'll explain creates some issues for us. But we'll go down as far as a three user license. Um, and we also use nonlinear. Um, we notify the instructors and we add the book, uh, the ebook links to their course sites for them. Uh, I would love to see a more <laughs> automated process like Liz has. Ours is very manual. Uh, and like Liz said, we try to buy unlimited user ebooks uh, 
versions of every single textbook submitted by faculty to the bookstores, but the Unlimited just isn't always an option, and ebooks aren't even an option for academic libraries to buy in many cases. So each semester, we're only able to provide about 20% of faculty requested textbooks as library ebooks. So this is a screenshot of a student's online book list, and we've worked with the bookstores to add a Check UA Library for ebook link. If the library offers that textbook as an ebook, students see the message, "Yay, the library has just the ebook you're looking for." If an ebook isn't available from the library, they get a sorry about that message. And our ability to provide this information to students really depends on faculty submitting their textbooks, um, their adoptions to the bookstores on time, um, submitting them at all. And there isn't a great track record of that at the U of A. We've tried to involve the provost in encouraging faculty to submit on time, so we're still working on that. But if we don't know that a class is using a particular ebook, we can't provide this information to students. If you want to learn more about affordable content efforts, I highly recommend this ebook, which was released this summer by the University of Minnesota Libraries. Um, two of my colleagues at the U of A wrote Chapter 7, detailing how our ebook program works, and I wrote Chapter 16 about inclusive access. So the Cliff Notes version of my chapter is that inclusive access is expanding rapidly on our campus and across the country. I do have some concerns about it, particularly about long-term pricing and whether opting out is truly an option, especially if courseware is bundled and required to pass the class. Um, access lengths are another issue. Inclusive access really works like a digital rental. So depending on what's been negotiated, access may last for just one semester. So what's been the impact of these programs at the U of A? These are estimated savings for UA students over the past five years. Um, we estimate nearly a million dollars from OER and 4.2 million from library licensed eBooks. The UA bookstores estimate that they've saved students $3 million in just the past fiscal year alone with inclusive access. So these savings are encouraging, but we still have challenges to overcome. The, the latest Babson survey shows that faculty awareness of OER is still really low. We've also found that faculty get little training in the selection of course materials. They're often unfamiliar with fair use and how that works, and they're unsure whether using particular content is legal. Discoverability is an issue, both for OER and library license content. There's no central repository for higher ed OER, although the open textbook library is the first place I advise people to check because it has more than 500 complete textbooks. When our library switched to Alma Primo this summer, we had a lot of challenges with findability of content, especially certain material types like streaming video. That's slowly improving a bit. The lack of OER ancillaries can be a barrier for faculty, like Liz mentioned, uh, especially if they want pre-made PowerPoint slides or courseware with test banks and homework questions, um, courseware that does auto grading. OpenStax, uh, Stax with an X, uh, is an OER publisher that's done a great job of offering ancillaries for free or at low cost. I would love, love, love to have an ebook database um, like Liz's library offers, where faculty could search for ebooks on their own. Uh, we use so many different acquisition models and ebook providers, it's hard even for our library employees to sort out things like nonlinear licenses, patron-driven versus evidence-based acquisition models, subscriptions versus purchases, and how auto-upgrades of licenses work. So unless the book is DRM-free or allows unlimited use, it's really hard for faculty to tell whether a particular ebook will work for course use. There's also a lot of manual work involved in both our ebook program and the bookstore's inclusive access model. 
as both grow, we're trying to work on ways to automate our processes. I think the bookstores are a little bit ahead of us on that. I've also found that working one-on-one -on -one with faculty is an effective approach, but it's also time consuming. And sometimes I become a bottleneck in the process. So in order to scale up efforts to improve affordability, we need to offer more self-serve options. And lastly, I like this photo because sometimes it does feel like you're all alone in the dark, uh, hanging by a thread, uh, but you shouldn't feel alone because there's a really great community out there of people working to improve textbook affordability. And on our campus, I'm really lucky to have great partners. I co-lead an OER action committee, which includes all of these stakeholders. Uh, the bookstores, our teaching and learning center, instructional designers, central IT, the Disability Resource Center, student government, faculty, and the UA Press. Administrators are a missing component that we really need to add. And we're fortunate to have a great relationship with our bookstores. They're campus owned and really do look out for students' best interests. And they tell me that textbooks aren't where they make their most money that the Clinique makeup counter and Wildcat gear are more profitable than textbooks. It's taken time to develop the bookstore partnership. Uh, I have a hint, do a, do a pilot project together. Uh, now we do joint presentations and report combined savings figures. And nationally, the UA is active in the Open Textbook Network and SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. We're also in OpenStax institutional partner, and I've found all of three of these to be great networks and resources. So that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, as I'm sure audience agree, really, really interesting and useful presentation. Uh, those savings numbers are amazing. Um, and guys, if you have any questions about that or anything in particular, I can see a few of you have asked your question specifically to Cheryl, which is great. We will uh, come to that in 10 to 15 minutes time when we have the Q&A session. Um, thank you, Cheryl. I'm going to introduce our final speaker now. Um, this is Jörg Six, and he is Head of uh, Product Technologies for Major, Re major Reference Works at Spring and Nature. Um, he works on textbooks and reference works from various angles, editorial, technology, workflows, marketing, and sales. He's previously worked as a commissioning editor for Springer's prestigious mathematics textbook program, and he was software engineer for SAP. I'm going to hand over to Jörg now. Hello, everyone. Uh, a warm, wet welcome from London. Um, without further ado, I go to my slides. Um, so this is about textbooks. Um, a slightly like diverse couple of. I want to give you some a view from from a publisher. Various points. It's a complex project, complex top topic, you know, you can't exhaust that in 10 minutes, but I'll give it a, I'll give it a go. Um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about textbooks and student behavior, maybe not only from a US perspective, but also from a more general and international perspective. That's simply because for a publisher like, like us, um, the US market is very important, you know, American users, readers are very important to us, but we, of course we have a global view of this as well. Um, maybe Starting off with a very almost trivial sounding question. How are textbooks used? And that sounds a little bit trivial, but I think it's quite interesting to sort of make yourself aware how they're used. Of course, what we're talking about a lot are adoptions, meaning a lecturer picks his textbook and basically tells the students, that's the Bible of this class, go forth and buy it or download it. Um, this happens often for lower undergrad, for undergraduate courses. But also for postgraduate courses. I, when I was with I did uh, an exchange here in Brandeis and MIT, there were some courses on PhD level where textbooks were mandated by the lecturer, and sometimes they would give out their own notes or so would just teach uh, in during the class. But there is more. Um, there is also reading lists that go along with the course that are much much fuller, much richer than tech, just a textbook, um, particularly in the humanities where people have to read around a topic. Exam preparation plays an enormous role. Um, students try to fit for, want to pass an exam and then will recruit, um, will we'll look at a, at a textbook 
maybe not even a textbook that was assigned for that course. Uh, maybe because of self-study, that's another reason people consult textbooks, but also because they want to get a different angle. Um, books offer an alternative explanation. For example, when a lecturer, all their lecture notes, all the, um, the, um, ad the adopted textbook is not clear. And you know, not everyone who is a professor actually is a gift very gifted educator. Um, and we all seen that in our lives where somebody tries to explain something to us and we didn't quite get it. But then somebody came on with a different angle and then we did. And so textbooks also serve that purpose. I remember when I was a student, we were basically, we couldn't understand what's happening. We just picked any textbook from the shelf that has vaguely the name of the course and then figure out, read up those sections that we didn't understand to get an idea what's going on, well, how, what, what these lectures mean. Um, let me also point another po last point, which has been mentioned before, that is the importance of print. L um, surveys show that students still love print, and the interesting thing is uh, that this is a sort of, um, this, this opinion echoes throughout. Even today, some, I think it was mentioned in both, um, both presentations, but also when I talk to other librarians, also in other parts of the world, they tell me print is important, and there are studies by uh, agencies like Outsell who prove that. What I find even more interesting is there's a bit of a psychological component to that. So there are um, studies have been done where they, psychologists were interested in questions like knowledge retention. So basically they, they ask students to read up on a particular topic, they give them a book in print as well as in several electronic formats. Then off they go for a couple of hours and then they bring them back to a test. And then you can find out how much have these students actually remembered from what they've read. And the studies show that print is doing better, um, which is quite interesting. Um, um, but there's also a point beyond textbooks, because when we talk about textbooks, we care about, of course, the largest population, largest user population at a university, and that are students. But students do not only read textbooks. Um, they have to write essays, they do projects, which also require textbooks, but also other types of literature. And if I looked at reading lists, well, uh, I did a little bit of an analysis of, uh, for, for various universities. What you see is lecturers want, to want students to read more widely. So this is not only teaching and learning is not only restricted to textbooks. There's another thing I found quite interesting. Um, we do regular uh, surveys of our end users, of our uh, end users on Springer Link, which is our e-publishing platform. And um, it turned out uh, in, I just quoted the one in 2016, that a third of our users seem to be students. At the time, um, I might not, um, it was actually quite surprising because a lot, of, um, a lot of people in the company thought, well, we're more research publisher, you know, we do monographs and journals, but we saw, wow, there's so many students out there. Um, only 8% of our global usage is textbooks. So the question was, what are all these kids doing on our platform? Well, we asked them. And what's quite interesting is they, uh, a lot of them, the majority, was actually interested in writing papers, writing a thesis, presenting, preparing a presentation. And then is also a, a strong need. Um, there's a strong need um, to, to read up on a topic to help them in these very important tasks. Um, another um, interesting, a lot of spotlight you see, I'm, I'm throwing a couple of spotlights at this topic, um, is the question of multimedia and video. So um, what you would think nowadays is most people learn, 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 would love to learn on YouTube. I mean, I've done some DIY recently in the house and YouTube was really useful, but does this translate to the academic world. Now, here's an interesting study from Outsell where text-based material is still seen as the most important source for information, for education, for learning. Video is very important, but text is, is, is still there. Interestingly, um, lectures are, in a sense, more progressive than the students. The students are more conservative. 82% say, of the students say, we prefer text, whereas 74% of the lectures, uh, professors think text is important, but they also think video is more important. Um, 
We talk a lot about textbooks in general, but I think it's also quite interesting maybe to look at this a couple of, of, of examples here. And let me just go through a couple of them, because some of these textbooks also tell you a story um, and tell you a little bit, also a little bit beyond why, they, why they're useful and why they're interesting. And this is particularly the case with textbooks on a much slightly higher level or a technical level where if you're not a specialist in the subject, you don't really know what is going on here. So look at, let's look at the uh, two most, three most text used textbooks in the United States in 2017. So on the one hand side, we have the first one is Modeling Life. Now this is about biology, but it's about the mathematics behind biology. Last, biology has been a descriptive science, so where biologists go in and say, well, look, here's a cell and it divides and does this and that, and here are the constituents, here's the chemistry. Um, We've gone beyond that now in the last 20 years where we start using mathematical models to describe what biology does, which also leads then to applications in medicine and so on. Um, this one is interesting because it was written by lecturers at UCLA and most of its success also comes from UCLA. Um, and it is particularly successful, it, it, it was also surprising about its success is it's quite idiosyncratic in how we treat it. So a lot of textbooks, of course, sort of re-registered what you already know in a slightly different fashion. This is pretty new. And probably also explains the success. So this is also very brand new. Number two is elements of statistical learning. Well, that also sounds a bit boring and dull, so what's it all about? Well, statistical learning is one of the ingredients of artificial intelligence. And it's the most downloaded textbook 2017 worldwide. The authors are basically the rock stars of this part of AI. Uh, they've created a MOOC on this even, and uh, just to maybe emphasize the importance of this, um, statistical learning is, one of the applications is in speech recognition, and just a couple of months ago, Google announced that speech recognition is one of the next, is, is the holy grail of the next step in the development of mobile phones, of IT, um, because we have a lot of people around the world who speak complicated language and difficult to type. So maybe that's an explanation for the success of this book. The last one is transmission electron microscopy. Now, again, that's quite a mouthful. Now, it's based on a technology that was invented by a German physicist in the 1930s who got a Nobel Prize for this 50 years later. And um, the technology, like, like, why is this so successful? Well, it's nanotechnology. This is a technology, a microscope type of microscopy that allows you to go into detail um, to look at the material, at crystal structures. And nanotechnology, which is in stuff that we are already using, um, is, is, um, is quite important. Um, you might think all these authors are Americans. Now, it's not always true that a country adopts the, the books that are written by their own authors. For example, number seven in this list is a book on statistics written by a Danish author. I also sort of, just for the fun of it, tell you, as a nice comparison, what happens in other countries. Is this always the same? No, it's not. Even from university to university, this list will change. So, for example, in the UK, the number three books are one book on statistics. Interestingly enough, written by Dutch lecturers for Dutch universities, but for some reason, very surprisingly, it became a real hit in the UK. The second book is International, it is Partial Differential Equations. That's an American author. Um, he writes for different publishers, uh, CUP and us, and is very successful and loves writing these undergrad textbooks. PDs, basically the foundation of anything in engineering, physics. Um, if you want to make any kind of progress there on the theoretical side, you need to know PDs. The last one is also quite interesting. Again, a mouthful. What does additive manufacturing technologies mean? Um, probably you think, what a terrible, terrible name for a textbook. And why is it so hard? Oh, well, the subtitle tells you, tells you why. It says 3D printing. Not sure I can read it. Now, you remember a couple, five years ago, um, a lot of newspapers would have, told, would have predicted that now we all sit there with 3D printers and printing out our furniture, but that hasn't happened. So it's a bit of a, a hype died. However, in manufacturing, 3D printing is really important to do quick and rapid prototyping. But it's not enough just to buy this thing, you know, that it just gathers dust in your office. You also have to know how does it fit in into the development of new technologies, of workflows, of products. And this is what this book does. And it 
Another interesting example is this is a very new problem. And the book came right there in the right time. So timing often plays an important role. And I think we also want to do a new edition because this is the fun but also the exhausting part about this stuff, these kind of new technologies, they develop so quickly. So, um, th and this is also something you can see from the books. Some of them are older, a couple of years old. Some of them are very new, simply because you have to be, because it's about new topics, others are not. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'll head over to Matt. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jörg. Um, really interesting piece. Interesting to see the different uh, popularities in UK and um, US. I'm just going to take control. Ah, uh, there we go. And I'm back. Sorry, guys. Just had a temporary uh, technical glitch. Um, so I'm going to talk for approximately 60 seconds, but while I'm doing this, do feel free to type away any further questions that you might have. We do have a number to get to, so I'm not going to talk for too long. Um, but if you have any questions for Liz, for Cheryl, or for Jörg, please do type them in the Q&A box on the right-hand side now. Um, just to give you a bit of information about Spring and Nature webinars, we do run a number of webinars, which we call called Meet the Expert. You can find information on upcoming and previously recorded webinars at springnh.com forward slash for librarians. We also include information on our ACRL uh, choice webinars there as well, our Spring and Nature sponsored ones. Um, if you are interested in finding out further information about our ebook collections or textbooks, uh, again, you can go to springnature.com forward slash for librarians, click on the product link and you can select uh, textbooks or ebook collections. And now it is time for our QA. Um, like I said, we do have a number of questions that have come through. Um, Liz, I'm going to come to you with the first question. Before I ask it, guys, we have had a number of questions about whether the recording will be available. And just to let, let you know that, yes, it will be. You'll receive a link to look at the recording online within 24 hours of this session ending. Okay, um, coming to you um, now, Liz. So we have a question from Janice. Uh, the question um, is regards uh, the database. So are the books selected from the e-textbook database used in place of textbooks or in addition to textbooks? And this also, um, feel free to comment also in terms of whether you or the faculty actually encourage the use of the e-textbooks or do you balance with the demand for, for using print and if there's a, a if there is any emerging trend towards E, or if it is still print? Um, so the first part of the question was, do they actually replace it with a, a yeah. paid textbook with a, with a library textbook? I don't know. We don't ask, to be honest. Um, so if they are using the books that they're requesting just as supplemental reading, um, that's OK, too. Um, so I don't know for sure uh, for everyone who requests books through the textbook database. However, um, I do know some do because we've heard from them and they've told us that they do it that way. So I don't I don't keep um, a list of who's doing it and who's not at this point. Um, but uh, obviously, the people who have received our grants are doing that. We have people who anyone that we get it through the uh, textbook uh, list from the bookstore. Um, clearly, that's the paid textbook that we're now making available, freely available to students. Um, but through the database, I can't say for sure what, what uh, the motivation is of the faculty member at that point. But in the ones that I've talked to that frequently use the database, um, I do, it, it does appear that they're using them um, primarily and they're not assigning a paid textbook. Okay, cool. Thank you. And since we're on the note of the database, I will ask you the second question, Liz, and then we'll come on to you um, next show. Um, so this is from Andrea and uh, is about bookstore reaction. So how has your bookstore reacted to your textbook database and the library offering these options? Okay. Um, so in the beginning, the, text, the uh, bookstore did partner with us. And in fact, the books that we were making available, they put little signs above the print to tell the students that we, they were available through the library. Um, in addition to that, uh, when they give us the textbook list, we actually don't ILL textbooks, um, print textbooks, because it's too much of an effort on our part. And um, so it's kind of, uh, um, 
a partnership in that matter. And in addition to what Cheryl said, what we're doing is a drop in the bucket for the bookstore, to be honest. I don't think we're actually causing any sort of um, issue in their uh, profits because they're now profiting more off of other materials that they sell, like um, uh, T-shirts and such, uh, more than they probably are for the textbooks themselves. Cool. Thank you, Liz. Um, Cheryl, a uh, question similarly in the same sort of realm um, regards the bookstore relationship. So this comes from Sumai. Um, how did your library negotiate with the bookstore when it came to adding the uh, inverted commas check UA library to ebook? Um, as she often sees the library, would often see the library as a competitor to the university. You may or may not agree with that. So it's just in terms of how, how that um, played out. Yeah, you know, that was before my time. Um, so we've had that on there for a while, and we um, it, it may be covered in some of the publications that my um, my colleagues have done about the ebook program. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's our IT department working with them to um, to get that information uploaded into a, a database. Yeah, so it's it's just been ongoing. Okay, cool. And I'll come to you again, Cheryl, with the next question. Um, this comes from Alex, and it's regards um, purchasing eBooks when unlimited access is not available. Uh, the question is, do you purchase multiple copies to limit the number of turnaways, or do you have a different approach? Yes, we do purchase multiple copies with our auto upgrade program. We have a, a cap of $1,000 per title. So we kind of take a look to see at the size, at the size of the course enrollment and also what the nonlinear license um, number is. And if it's a course, you know, a, a huge course of 500 or more students, uh, we'd be reluctant to use a, a three-user book or a or a nonlinear book, even if it auto upgrades, unless um, the price is low enough that we could buy a lot of copies and not have issues with turnaways. But all student, I mean, the students wait until <laughs> the night before um, the homework's due, or the the reading is due, and or the test is the next morning. So we know that they're all trying to use it at the same time. So turnaways are an issue. And we have had a book that we thought would auto upgrade, but that uh, to unlimited and the unlimited option disappeared. Um, so with the books that will auto upgrade, which is our books from uh, ebook, our sorry EBSCO and eBook Central from ProQuest, um, we've started buying the unlimited license off the bat if we know it's going to be used in a course. Our previous approach was to buy a single license and let it auto upgrade as needed, but we found that the higher level licenses were disappearing. Cool. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to Elizabeth now. So, a couple of questions in the realm of the database itself. Um, so, so, Liz, this is kind of around the background data. So the question is regards um, where where are they, so this comes from Laura, where are they, I see that means students, faculty, where are they, or the university in general, where are they putting data, where are they putting the data in their ebook database from? Um, and there's also a question from Nicole around, which is a similar area um, in terms of how how was the database created? This may be a question for, I'm, I'm not sure how much you know about the background, but feel free to answer so, as you wish. Yeah, so uh, the database was created by our um, programming uh, team in our library, or, um, and uh, it's just an SQL database in the back end. Um, and the lists themselves uh, come directly from the publishers um, in relation to uh, what we've purchased usually for in the beginning we were mostly just purchasing big packages we sort of moved away from that at this point as much and more buying individual titles and doing ebs programs so um we're getting the title list directly from uh the publishers um at that point we don't use our mark records at this point i 
believe LSU does have a mark record feed from their ILS. So I think it's possible. We just don't do it here. We just moved our ILS in uh, last January. So I'm not sure we figured out how that would work if we wanted to do it that way. Um, however, it is an option. The one thing by doing it that way, though, is you sort of leave out the things you don't own, already own. So um, there's a little bit of massaging to do in that way. Um, uh, but that's basically how, where we get the lists and how the back end sort of works. Um, it's it's pretty simple, to be honest. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Liz. You've also answered Doreen's question as well, which is great. Um, uh, I'm going to come to you, Cheryl. Um, so the question from Zainab, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Sorry if I haven't. haven't. Um, have you noticed an increase in complaints from students now that's, and this may not be the case actually, you might want to comment on what the case is, but have you noticed an increase in complaints from students now that some textbooks are freely slash readily available through e the ebook format while those for their other classes are not? Not an increase in complaints, but we have checked the um, Google Analytics on that uh, check link feature and it's it's amazing. It's one of <laughs> we were we were shocked by the number of hits that gets students trying to see if there is a free version available. We at the University of Arizona Libraries don't have e-textbook reserves or print textbook reserves. Um, we do get complaints about that, but I think if they see that there's a free ebook available, they're mostly happy. Cool. That's good to hear. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, okay, I think that's, do you carry, we do have another couple of minutes guys if you have any further questions, um, I mean we have, we've sort of covered it before but we can, we can delve, delve into it. So Rita asks, it is about the bookstore again, so the whole issue with bookstore, it sounds like you have a very good relationship with your bookstore. So the question is, I'll ask you, Cheryl, do you think your bookstore would be as willing to partner if it were owned by an external entity? You know, I've talked with um, colleagues who work on these projects who do have um, Follett and Barnes and Noble bookstores on their campuses, and they say it can be harder to get data, but I wouldn't say it's impossible. Um, some of my colleagues have made the argument that it's it's public data if there's a public institution um, as far as trying to get the list of required course materials. Um, it, yeah, it's it, that can be trickier uh, if it's a corporate owned bookstore. But I wouldn't give up hope entirely. I would I would try and see what you can do and slowly build that relationship. Sure. Thank you. Um, Liz, did you want to do you want to comment at all on bookstore relationships? If you had anything to comment on that question, um, well, um, I will say we do have a corporate bookstore. Ours is a Barnes and Noble. Um, like I said, if you can kind of um, have it be a, um, a shared relationship in in the in the effect that we don't ILL textbooks, so that helps them, and then the textbook also helps us get eBooks. So I think it's sort of a, uh, a mutual partnership in that way. Um, and ultimately, they need to actually be showing the campus that they are interested in this, to be honest, because the campus doesn't have to use them. You know, they can get another contract for someone else or do an independent bookstore. It, you know, they work for the campus just as much as the campus works for them. So there should be some sort of partnership between the campus and the bookstore in lots of different ways. And it, it makes sense for them to, as on a community, uh, relations part of it to be um, amenable to these kinds of programs. Sure, thank you. Um, guys, I'm conscious that we are bang on the hour. I will ask one final question and then uh, we'll let you leave since we do have such uh, interest from our audience. And this is a question for both uh, Liz and Cheryl. I'll come to you first, Liz. Um, so if you do not have unlimited users for a textbook that's been requested, how do you make sure your students have access to their courses during the semester? Do you get complaints from students or do you tend to favor DRM free textbooks or what would be your approach there? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Can you say that again? Yeah, sure. So it, it was if you do not have unlimited users uh, for the textbook, mm -hmm. so if the, if the textbook is not DRM free, how would you make sure that the students have 
access for their course during the semester? Uh, we don't purchase books that aren't DRM free or okay. limited access. Cool, that answers so, that question. I, we, yeah. The reason we do that is because we used to get complaints. Okay. So um, that's why we have this, um, these rules. Uh, but particularly for a course use, I would. I mean, I know Cheryl does it, and 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 it's certainly possible. But um, from our end, it, it makes more sense to have them DR free and unlimited user, just so that we don't run into those issues. Cool. Perfect. Um, and Cheryl, did you want to comment from your end as well? Yeah. Um. It, and. I, I like Liz's approach. Um, we've decided not to limit ourselves to DRM free here because there's a, a larger selection of available ebooks that are not um, just unlimited user. Um, but it does it can cause issues. We don't buy print. Um, digital is our preferred format. So if it's available digitally, we do not buy a print backup. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm rushing through the questions, but we are over now. I thank you both for your very prompt responses to those questions. Um, so and we, so we, got, we got to 90% of the questions, guys. Sorry for those of you that we couldn't get to, but we tried to cover as much as possible. We are now two minutes over as well. So I'm just going to um, end by saying thank you all for, for joining us for this session. Um, thank you to uh, Liz Seiler and Cheryl Coulier for joining us. Thank you to so Jörg Six from Spring Nature as well. Um, do look out for the link of the recording that will go out tomorrow, sent from ACRL Choice. Um, and please join us again in the future for our, our next webinar. Please look out for that. So thanks very much, guys, and have a great day uh, wherever you are. Cheers.